Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vanessa Little. I'm the director of NFE Ecosystem Architecture over at VMware, but uh, try not to hold that against me. I'm going to talk to you today about um, some of the gaps in using OpenStack for multi-access edge computing and distributed architectures or MEC architectures. Um, I'm going to go through some of the, the design flaws in, in OpenStack that need to be remediated to really make it effective for MEC. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can work around those things today so that you can at least achieve smaller deployments. So here's, here's the agenda of what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to define what, what MEC is in case anyone is a little foggy on that. Um, and we're going to look at the core architecture challenges. We're going to look at some of the tools or bolt-ons that also have challenges. Um, and then we're going to talk about what we can do about it. So there are two widely used terms that seem to be interchangeable in the, in the industry. Um, there's, there's mobile edge computing, which specifically talks about um, pushing workloads to the edge for telco and mobility workloads, so cellular workloads. Uh, and then there's multi-access edge computing, which is what I'm really more focused on in this lecture today. Um, and that talks about any kind of infrastructure that's pushed to the edge, not necessarily for telco workloads, but any workloads generically. So when you look at mobile edge computing or multi-axis edge computing architecture, what we're really looking at is a centralized um, control plane where your orchestration lives and your, your core VIM components live. And then you've got these edge data centers. And an edge data center could be as small as one node. It could be a cell phone. It could be a connected car. Um, or it could be a micro data center. Um, when you look at the shape of, of these types of architectures, um, they, they really take different types of, of uh, iterations. And so because the, what you define as the edge could be so many different things, it could even be a, a camera, um, the, the, the architectures can, can shift and pivot a bit, but the, the overall fundamentals are the same, where you have centralized orchestration and, and VIM management, SDN management, and then you have your workloads, or your actual VNFs, or your, your workload VMs or, or containers pushed down to the edge, closer to the users that are consuming those services. When you look at um, what the use case is that people are looking for MEC for, particularly in the telco space, um, these, these topologies get really massive. And so when you're starting to look at things like 5,000 edge clusters all, that are all centrally managed by one node, you start to notice some of the cracks in OpenStack as it is currently built today in being able to manage those types of architectures. And so this is another visualization of, of when you think of MEC and you think of centralizing that control plane, that network orchestration, that service orchestration, and then pushing those services out to an edge data center um, you don't necessarily have to have direct connected network fabric to do that. You can push it over the internet. Those edge data centers can actually exist in a public cloud somewhere, in a private cloud on-prem with a customer. Um, they can exist pretty much anywhere, and they, can, they don't necessarily have to be fixed in one particular place. The, the whole concept behind MEC is that those edge data centers, those edge devices can move, and they can appear in different places. And so being able to automate the control and, and telemetry and the management of, of those edge data centers poses really unique challenges. Um, traditional OpenStack wasn't really built for data centers that are moving. It wasn't, really, it wasn't really designed for data centers that are physically separate. It wasn't really designed for data centers that, are, um, that, that rise and fall in the blink of an eye, that, that may exist for one hour only and then be torn down. Um, and because of, because of this, because of the volatile nature of MEC, that also presents a few unique challenges that we're going to discuss. When you look at how it's being used for uh, telcos and the telco use case, um, it, it becomes really nonsensical to assume that you can centralize every, all of your control into one data center. That would be a giant single point of failure. And so you look at clustering those core data centers where your control plane lives 
Um, and then you have this concept of aggregation data centers. And so that's where you summarize some of those control plane components so that you don't have to backhaul all of that control data from the centralized data center to the edge. So for those of you who are more, more network oriented people um, and you look at how um, telephony networks are built, you have a core network where a lot of your core switching and routing happens and you have your aggregation data centers that have summary routes for the edge data centers. So the concept uh, of that topology also applies to multi-access edge computing when you're looking at, at workloads um, and managing those workloads. So here's, here's, a, here's a scenario for you to think about. You've got a workload at a micro ed edge data center and you need to monitor it. Say for example, it's a, a video transcode application and you've pushed it down to that particular data center because you've determined that that data center is the most physically close and has the best ping time to the user that's, that needs that video to be transcoded. Now you need to pull telemetry data off of not only the VIM layer and the infrastructure layer, but also the app layer to, to determine that that service is healthy and to know whether or not you need to scale it out or restart it or, or no one's using it anymore so you can shut it down. But if you do that at a large scale and you've got 5,000 instances of these spread across a different country, um, pulling all of that telemetry data back to your centralized data center doesn't make any sense. What you would want to do instead is pull that telemetry to your aggregation data center and that's where the decision as to whether or not that service is healthy actually occurs. So instead of pulling all of that um, unmanaged telemetry to a central data center where the decision has to be made, you pull it a little bit closer so that you're not backhauling all of that traffic and then you make a decision and then only one instruction goes back to your centralized data center to say that service isn't healthy. I want to do something about it. In some MEC topologies, that do something about it operation actually occurs at the aggregation data center. And so being able to spread it out like that but still have the centralized data center manage the, the overall topology and then have the aggregation data centers manage the edge topologies um, is a lot more effective when you look at, at spreading out these, these workloads. And when you look at, at how the availability zone and cluster design in OpenStack is currently built, it's not really granular enough to do these types of data centers um, and these types of topologies. Because even though you can define different, different availability zones, different clusters within those availability zones, um, pushing a workload down to a specific node for a specific reason um, isn't really built into OpenStack today. There are some other tools that try to achieve this, but they're still lacking some of those telemetry bits that make that a very effective decision. And so one of the things, one, one of the more obvious things that uh, is a problem with OpenStack for MEC topologies is that there's some, some very obvious scalability limitations. Um, current in industry limits in production deployments max out at around 1,000 nodes. We know the theoretical limits are higher, but in practice, people are, are deploying no more than 1,000 nodes in one OpenStack deployment. Um, this obviously doesn't, doesn't bode well for MEC topologies who are looking at having 5,000 micro-edge data centers, not to mention how many data centers you'd have in the, the um, aggregation layer as well as the centralized layer. It's just simply not enough nodes to be able to build those types of topologies. Um, storage over WAN is, uh, is way too sensitive to latency and, and, uh, and packet loss. And so being able to, to manage your storage the way you typically do in an OpenStack cloud isn't really feasible over these architectures. And so you have to kind of break it and have different storage um, pods defined in each location. And it makes, makes the administration of those a little bit onerous. Um, when you're looking at over 500 hosts and 15,000 VMs in one region, um, but then you also have multiple regions within the same topology, it's, it's really bumping up against the limits of what OpenStack is currently capable of today. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. Um, one of the things that, that is a big issue is the image storage issues. So if you need to deploy a workload down to an edge data center, you don't really want to backhaul that image file all the way from your centralized data center right down to your edge. 
that some of those images can be quite large, and if you do it often enough, if you're, if you're actually having very volatile workloads pop up at the edge, which is one of the core uh, premises of MEC and, and the whole MEC topologies, pushing an image down every time you need to do a deployment becomes really ridiculous. It, it'll eat up all of your bandwidth, and it really makes the MEC topologies not, not financially viable. And so, to get around that, what you can do is put a glance image store locally, either at your aggregation site or right down to your, your MEC edge site. But now what you've done is built a whole lot of unique glance image stores that you need to keep in sync. So you now you have to deploy some tools to keep that um, in sync. Assuming, of course, that you want to keep it in sync because you might want to offer different versions of different images at different locations. When you start looking at um, some of the regulations, particularly in North America, around where you're physically allowed to supply certain content, now you, you're getting into a really complex mesh of how you manage all of your images. For example, what if you had a CDN network that, that shows local football games? In the United States, there's blackout rules that say that you can't actually distribute that content within a certain radius of the stadium. So being able to make that decision programmatically and manage all of those different image files uh, becomes pretty complex and pretty difficult. OpenStack doesn't currently have any tools out of the box to, to give you that capability. In order to achieve these, these multi-access edge computing architectures, SDN overlay networking is a must. Um, there are a lot of people who have been achieving a lot of proof of concepts by using ODL and influencing some of the physical devices between the centralized data center and the edge data center. And that's great on small scales, and it works really well on small scales. Uh, but when you want to start looking at building a full layer two mesh across 5,000 different data centers, being able to do that with ODL alone is, is not feasible. It's not, I don't even think it's possible. But I challenge the room, if anyone's actually pulled it off, I would like to hear more about it. Um, and so being able to, to snap in that SDN overlay networking becomes um, essential to achieve these, these architectures. And then being able to orchestrate that SDN overlay networking becomes essential. Because it's not feasible to man manually manage a network of that size by doing all of that configuration by hand. You need to, to push that either to an orchestrator or some sort of automation like Terraform or, um, or like one of the NFV Mano solutions to be able to pull that off. It's, uh, it's not trivial. And the biggest and most fundamental flaw in OpenStack that makes the MEC architectures not necessarily feasible is the bus-based architecture. RabbitMQ has some serious limitations around latency. And if you start to push those components further and further apart, um, strange, and interesting strange and interesting things will happen to your OpenStack cloud. Um, if the RabbitMQ bus has more than two milliseconds latency, um, you're going to see some odd behavior and you're going to start seeing failures in your cloud. But when you're pushing physical infrastructure, you know, possibly thousands of miles away, even having a really robust network between them, you're likely to get more than two milliseconds latency. And so having those control components centralized no longer become feasible. And what you end up having to do is have little OpenStack deployments all over that need to be centrally managed. So now instead of having one, one OpenStack deployment that manages 5,000 micro data centers, you have 1,000 OpenStack deployments that, that each manage you know, 200 data centers. But now you've got all these OpenStack instances to manage and maintain and, and push images across and roll up telemetry from and, and be able to, to migrate workloads from one instance to another. Now you need to have an orchestration layer that can do that. Even some of the more sophisticated MANO layers can't really manage infrastructures that large right now. Some of them boast that they can, but in practice no one's actually been able to pull it off yet. And so that's a, that's a real challenge with OpenStack is this bus-based architecture. But that is so ingrained into the core fundamental way that OpenStack is built, it's very difficult to work around. And so the only workaround to do that is to just have more OpenStack instances distributed closer to your edges, which is not necessarily feasible. Um, so as I just mentioned, the orchestration models and the tools, they're not really good enough to pull this off yet. 
um, when you start looking at intelligent workload placement and being able to gather all of the data that you need to make a decision about where to place your workload, current orchestrators don't even have that type of thing in their data model. For example, if you wanted to push a workload um, to the data center that has the lowest ping time to the user, none of the orchestration data models currently have this built in. So that if you wanted to model that service, that whole concept of ping time doesn't even exist in the data model. And not, even, if, even if it did exist in the data model, there's no way to actually pull that data out of OpenStack right now. There's no tools aside from adding bolt-ons or additional things or writing some scripts or having some, some various monitoring tools added on to get you that data. And so intelligent workload placement, which is a, like a core tenant of MEC and, and a very important factor, um, is not even possible with the current infrastructure today. So what do we do? What do we do instead? I think we've, we've beaten OpenStack to death. I think I've said a lot of really nasty things about OpenStack. So, so what's the solution? Um, th there's, another, there's a number of different paths that we can take here. Uh, one is to start adding, adding those features that we would like to see in OpenStack, which, as I mentioned, is going to be really difficult because of the way the RabbitMQ bus works. Pulling that out of OpenStack and replacing it with something that's a little bit more distributed is, is you know, kind of akin to changing an engine of a car that's running on the Autobahn. It's, it's not necessarily a great idea because of how much change it would in, impact into the code base. Um, a lot of people say containers are the solution for Mac. So if we just use Kubernetes and push a bunch of Kubernetes clusters down to the edge and find a way to central manage them, everything's going to be fine. In practice, there aren't enough applications that run in Kubernetes to make this feasible, especially in the telco space. And so when, when, you're, when you're looking at, at how, do you, how do you push these workloads to, to the edge, and even intelligent workload placement in Kubernetes is not really there yet, that, that whole concept of latency and ping times doesn't exist in Kubernetes either. Um, the only way you can get around that is by just deciding to spin up a new Kubernetes at that, at that micro data center and then tearing it down when you no longer need it. Well, what you're effectively doing is spinning up a Kubernetes instance every time you need to load an app. That's not really the way it was intended. That's not really the way it was built to, to work. Um, it, would, it would be a, a nasty workaround and, in my opinion, a waste of infrastructure to do it that way. Um, people that are currently doing it, they're using what I'm calling a, a hybrid model, where they have, they have some Kubernetes at the edge, they have some VMs at the edge, they have some, some IoT gateways at the edge, and they're using a lot of bolt-on open source stuff that they're manually integrating and making this unique snowflake of an architecture to be able to achieve all of these things and fulfill all of these different needs that they need to do to do intelligent workload placement, to be able to manage a cluster that's that, that large, to be able to manage these workloads and, and push them out where they need to be and actually be able to determine their service health on day two and do something about it when that service health fails. Um, and then the third, the third alternative solution is let's just scrap all of it and start over with a brand new open source project. Um, and so there's, there's some interesting things that are starting to pop up in the industry right now. Etsy has spun up uh, a whole mech initiative to be able to start defining what those standards should be, what do those components need to be in an effective mech architecture, what do those interfaces between them need to be. And similar to the approach that uh, Etsy took to NFV, they're taking to, to Mech, and their resolution is start over. This is, this is not an NFE architecture, so stop trying to use NFE tools, stop trying to use cloud tools to achieve this. Mech is something unique, and it needs to be addressed in a unique way with its own type of software and its own paradigm and its own architectures. Um, starting from scratch in, the, in that sense is, is a little bit scary, because I feel like we might be a little bit behind in that sense. Um, there are some interesting projects like Project Arcrano that have popped up in the past year to try to address these issues and start looking at, okay, what kind of tools do I really need at the edge? Um, Intel built their, their Network Edge Virtualization Software Development Kit to start making some of these, these apps a little more feasible. Um, and they've, they've started to build in tools that make modeling these apps um, a, little, a little easier to do. But it is, in effect, just an SDK. 
it's not a solution, it's not an app, it's a toolkit. It's like, it's like throwing you a bag of tools and a, and a pile of lumber and saying, okay, build me a house. It's not, it's, it's not a house. And so it pushes the responsibility back onto the open source community to say, okay, if these are the standards that are coming out of Etsy and we all kind of agree that this is the way it should be, here's the toolkit I have, well, let's get to it. And that's what Project Arcrano is, is, is attempting to do. And I think so far they've had some reasonable success. Um, there have been some really interesting demos at this, at this uh, show and also at the one in Vancouver where they've demonstrated some of the things they're already able to achieve at the edge, but it's by no means finished. And the real question of the day is, can we wait for something new? With all of the hype around Mac and 5G and IoT and everyone saying, I need to go to market with these services now, is it feasible to really wait for the Etsy standards? We all know how long those take. Is it feasible to wait for a brand new open source project to spin up out of nowhere and, and become a viable solution that's production ready and, and fully supportable and is gonna have commercial vendors that are gonna distribute their own version of it and support it and you'll have someone to call when it breaks so that you can maintain all of your SLAs? Can we wait for that? I don't, I don't think we can. Um, so what's gonna happen? My personal prediction is people are going to deploy the hybrid architectures with the NFV tools that are available today, and there's going to be some serious functionality gaps in those until these new platforms are ready. And then you're, you're going to see a massive exodus and a massive migration. And will that end architecture have OpenStack in it? Probably not. It'll probably be something totally different, or some spin-off, or maybe some components from OpenStack that are, that are applicable will be cherry-picked and added to this new architecture. Um, but OpenStack as it currently exists today, I don't believe will be in the, the end state architecture for Mac. But I'm interested to hear what you folks think. Um, so I've left a little time for questions and comments. So anyone who has an opinion on what I've said, because I've offered a lot of my opinions in this lecture that you may or may not agree with, so please feel free to, to step up and ask some questions or, or offer your own opinion. Just, just onto your last statement that OpenStack might not be the feasible choice for the Mac in the, in the long run. You mentioned one of the solutions might be that the OpenStack clusters would be pushed towards the edge and they would have some controllers and they would manage some different servers that are very close, up, uh, very close from the controllers, be it below two milliseconds just to avoid the, the problems related to Rabbit. Is that not a feasible choice? Because then, indeed, we have multiple OpenStack clouds. We move the problems a bit away from OpenStack, but that's just the way how to push images, how to push flavors, networks, etc. But I, I bet that there will be some ways to do that in a in a in a nice way. So why not OpenStack? Just just asking the question. Yeah, I I, I mean I agree. Um, it, it is it is one solution to push a complete OpenStack cloud to every edge. But when you're managing over 5,000 edges, is that really a feasible solution? I would argue no. It's very difficult to, to manage you know, maybe 20 unique OpenStack clouds within the same infrastructure. When you have 5,000 that are all doing something a little bit different uh, and being able to leverage them um, as failover clouds for each other, um, that, that, gets, that gets pretty onerous, that gets pretty difficult and it requires some pretty clever architecture and some pretty clever day-to-day -day maintenance and a pretty wicked orchestrator to be able to sew all that together. Sorry, you had a question? I wanted to ask if you see similar uh, initiatives uh, like um, the Nobel cells, which would support uh, something like this. Am I seeing similar initiatives? Uh, sorry, where? Uh, Nobel cells, as explained, for example, in the CERN uh, use case, yeah, they use it really to have something like 73 cells in, in various locations, not only in Geneva, and uh, get the results, and get the locality of some of the components, while clearly explain that, uh, that Newton and some other projects uh, are very different. So, so I would appreciate if, if, the, if the community would uh, work towards uh, such kind of, yeah. 
I would appreciate it too, because I think that's definitely a step in the right direction, being able to, to disaggregate um, different nova cells and, and manage them is definitely a, a step down the right path, but it still, it still bumps up against that RabbitMQ issue. Um, and even if you have unique instances of RabbitMQ paired with each of those different nova cells, um, it's still very difficult to manage because effectively what you've done is you've, you've built like a mini OpenStack cloud. It's not necessarily the same OpenStack cloud. You've just broken off a few pieces but you have, because you have to keep pairing that RabbitMQ bus and keep it proximal uh, because of the way it works and the way workloads are pushed onto that bus, um, it doesn't necessarily solve the problem. But it, it does allow you to scale out a little bigger than you can with just, just basic um, OpenStack today. Anyone else? Are you potentially working on something like uh, federation? There's a lot of people working on federation kind of one layer up, uh, and they're doing it at the orchestration layer. And what they're doing is um, underneath, they're connecting to unique OpenStack instances and unique um, OpenStack clouds, but what they present to the user is more of a unified experience where they push a lot of the same config down to those OpenStack clouds to make them appear the same. So effectively, they're, they're sort of faking it at the orchestration layer. Um, ONAP's approach is kind of like this. OSM's approach is also very similar. Um, as of release five, they have this feature called WIM management. And so wide area VIM management where you have multiple VIMs, but to the orchestrator, it just exposes one field of compute that happens to have multiple data centers in it. Um, it's one, it's, it's one way to work around it. It's one way to mitigate it, but there's still, there are still some unique challenges about being able to migrate a workload from one OpenStack instance or one OpenStack cluster to a different one. Even if they're configured completely the same, there's a lot of, there's a lot of logic and workflow that has to happen to be able to take one of those workloads and copy it to another one. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much for coming early. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know it's difficult on the last day of the conference. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can either catch me in the hall or my information's on the, on the app with this lecture. So feel free to reach out and, and chat about any of the stuff we've discussed today. All right, thank you.